Good? Is that good? Fantastic. Sorry for the uh, technical challenges there. I'm not sure what went wrong. I thought only, <laughs> I won't say this since it's been recorded, but I, <laughs> go on, I'll say it anyway. I thought only Link uh, was this dodgy. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, thanks for having me join and come and talk about API management. As you saw, I have some slides to show you. Hopefully um, PowerPoint will hold up this time. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about, let me get rid of this, let me get rid of this chat window for a moment. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, the Azure API management product um, and uh, some of the stuff we've just released. And maybe if we have time, I'm going to give you a sneak peek into our laboratory and show you a prototype of some of the features we've been working on. Before I get started, though, can you give me um, a, just by response in the chat room here, um, a sense of how many of you are aware of or are familiar with API management. Actually, no, pause, hold up, stop. How many people don't know about API management? Just say, I, I'm unfamiliar. Oh, I've done this wrong now. I don't know if those me's are not familiar with the product. I don't know, I don't know what it means. We've got one guy, a couple. Okay, here in, here in, Starts again. Yeah, no, I got it. I, there's some people who are unfamiliar with the product. We're we're all friends here. Sam, Sam Sam's very familiar. Um, okay, right. So what I need to do, I'm afraid, for some of you who are familiar with the product, is I do need to set a common framework for everybody because API management is a, a very interesting product in terms of it's a set of tools that can be applied to a number of scenarios. And if you're unfamiliar with the with this space, I think it's it's actually pretty complicated. It takes a while to grok. So for the people who are familiar with it, this is good um, rehearsal. This is good refresher topic. For the people that are new to it, it's important. But I will try and go through this intro prep as quickly as possible, so that I can get to the new stuff for the folks that have already seen some of uh, some of the product. Uh, next slide. Okay. So I want to talk quickly about why Azure entered this space of API management. And it all hinges around this notion of an accelerated uh, and growing interest in the API economy. This is where APIs are now used as, you know, the primary conduit of so many business scenarios. Um, and I want to talk about about some of those scenarios specifically. Again, I'm, I'm going through this at some speed to allow me to have some time to talk about some of the new stuff that we have coming in the pipe. This is our sort of basic refreshers. Let me give you some scenarios. I find scenarios make things very concrete for me, make it very easy to um, uh, to, to understand uh, uh, what a product is for. So I'm going to give you some concrete scenarios. Let's talk about, for example, um, ISVs and how they might use a product like API management. There are an increasing number of ISVs whose primary method of business, the primary way they do business, is to transact through APIs. They maybe sell access to an API. So we have um, one example customer I'll talk about now that uses Azure API management called Fantasy Data. And they sell data about the National Football League here in the US, about American football. That can be used for um, building fantasy football apps or NFL apps, and you can get all the stats and all of the data in real time using this API. And they charge money for that. You know, they charge um, uh, money for access to that API, and that's their business model. And in order to do that, there are a lot of um, problems that uh, an ISV would have to go and solve. So obviously, the, one of the problems they have to go and solve is understand and mine and present all this NFL data. But then there's a whole other spectrum of issues that they need to solve if they want to sell data, sell services, through an API. There are many other businesses doing this as well. Just think of SendGrid or Twilio, you know, hundreds and thousands of, of businesses doing this today. Another example is businesses looking to find new channels to engage with customers and in often case, uh, new ways of making revenue alongside their existing business. The poster child of this, um, this isn't an, AP, an Azure API management customer, but it's a very common scenario. I think it's very easy to understand, is Walgreens. So Walgreens is a very large drugstore here in the United States, a very large pharmacy. And obviously they sell pharmaceuticals, they sell uh, toiletries, uh, they even do photo printing, just like most 
um, pharmacies have done these days. They've diversified their business model. And they had an idea to allow people to print pictures um, via their phone. You know, I can take a picture of my phone, upload it, and then go and collect my pictures from the pharmacy. But they realized that building their own application would be very difficult. It'd be very difficult to get any visibility, to draw any attention to that in the App Store. It's very hard to get visibility in the App Store. You can just pour good money after bad and still get nowhere on that front. So they had a different idea, which is what if we make an API and provide free access to that API for any developer? Now, developers of photo apps can print photos via Walgreens API just by integrating with this very easy to use um, API that Walgreens have shared. And what's in it for the developer? Well, Walgreens would provide a revenue share. They'd give, you know, some number, maybe 10 cents, whatever, to each, um, to the developer for each picture that's printed through their API. This creates a great multi-dimensional market because the de app developers are very happy because they're starved of revenue and they have additional revenue channel. Walgreens get much better visibility in the app store because now they're in many photo apps and Walgreens get more print, print, print excuse me, more pictures printed. So everybody's happy. Again, to do this, they need an API, and they need more than just an API. There's a lot of other concerns that they need to worry about that I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, we also see people in the API economy um, looking to leverage APIs to increase their marketing capability and to build customer relationships. So British Airways launched an open API program where they provide access to some of their data and services. And um, you know, there's no monetization going on directly there. They're just providing access to these APIs for app developers to integrate into their sites or their apps or their, you know, their mobile um, uh, applications. And the hope is that if those experiences get embedded, then that in general creates a better experience for British Airways customers. In fact, what we're seeing is this is going full circle now where you don't want to be the business that's left behind in this race um, to join the API economy because you're the guys who are going to have the worst experience out there because other app developers can't use your data and integrate it into this big mesh of software that's eating the world. And then for customer relationships, we see a lot of customers um, really looking to provide a higher level of engagement for their customers as part of their product, which requires an API. One example of a customer that's using Azure API management here is Wellmark, which is a mutual insurance company in the US. And they want to make it very easy for their corporate customers to integrate their, their health services into their own employee portals. And you guys all know as integration experts and developers that the ideal way you do that is via an API. And again, you need an API, but you need much more than that. So another scenario where we see people using um, the API management products is basically API security. So imagine if uh, you have um, an API that's being used by your mobile application and you just put it out there on the internet and you can't isolate your different apps. There's no way of looking at the telemetry from different applications. Just a simple mobile API gateway. This is what we think of as being on the the more junior part of the maturity curve of an API program. But nonetheless, we're seeing a lot of customers really interested in using our product just to help them beef up some of the capabilities around their API in terms of um, analytics, um, some rate limiting, et cetera. And then finally, internal agility. This is, this is one area where we're seeing a real boom in, in interest. And the idea here is that APIs are great for sharing with partners and the developer public at large, but they're also important internally, particularly at large businesses where there are genuinely thousands of APIs often around inside a, a, a large business. Like here at Microsoft, we know there's well over 2,500 APIs. Now, in order to accelerate my business, it may be a value for me to be able to use one of those APIs and pull some data out, look at historic trends or look at current trends or understand customer segmentation, especially in this world of big data and machine learning, access to data is critical. But I would have no chance of finding which APIs even exist. If I wanted to sign up for them, I'd probably be lucky to find some old Word document that explains how to use the old SOAP API. And you know that's if I can find anybody at all. The person working on it maybe has left, and they're not too keen to share it because it supports a mission critical function. If I go in there and do something silly, then maybe I'll bring down this mission critical function that's been running for many years. An API program built on a platform like Azure API Management can enable your business to become much more agile by providing a managed discovery and access and governance point for this kind of internal API program. 
So those are some of the scenarios in which we're used. Let me talk about um, our timeline. Um, I'll give you a, a sort of a brief history. Um, you show here that we, we previewed this product in um, in April, and sorry, in May 2014 last year. And that was the result of an acquisition. So we acquired a company called Epiphany back in October 2013. We spent that time bringing that to market, um, making it meet with all of the Azure compliance requirements and security requirements. And then we launched it in May and have seen a, a tremendous amount of adoption to date. In September last year, we GA'd the product, meaning that you now get an SLA and have general availability with the standard tier of 99.9%. Now, in January 14, just passed in uh, last month, we launched the premium tier, which is one of the things I want to talk about with you today. And we are making releases to this product every week. There are new updates you can find out on our change log. There are new updates coming every week. Sometimes it's performance improvements and there's always bug fixes for any issues or, or improvements that we can make. And of course, we're releasing features all the time as well. And if we have time at the end of the call today, I'll give you a sneak peek of one of the features that we're experimenting with in our labs right now. It should be Jan 15. Thank you for the, um, for the correction. I, it should be January 15, little typo. Um, oh, I don't know what that is doing over there either. I've got a little bit of a messy deck here. My apologies. Um, I just want to give you a quick layout of the land so you're familiar with how this product works. And I'll, I'll show you how we can help as well in just a moment with a very quick demo. Um, but API management is comprised of three pieces. We have a developer portal, we have a proxy, and we have a publisher portal. And you have typically an existing backend API that you want to manage. What you do is you create an instance of API management you configure our proxy to talk to that API, and then you um, enter details by you as the administrator come in and configure the publisher portal. You come in here and enter some details, and you configure the proxy and the developer portal by entering information about this backend API over here. Then developers or partners or internal employees, whatever your scenario, come to the developer portal. They register and sign up, and they can learn how to use your API and use our interactive experience to accelerate the time it takes for them to learn how to use your API. And I'll show you how that works in just a moment. They go on to create apps and services. And those apps and services call your API, but instead of calling the API directly, they go through our high-performance proxy that's part of the API management product. And that, in turn, invokes the API. Now, it's this proxy in the middle that is, um, it's this proxy in the middle, excuse me, it's this proxy in the middle that is responsible for the um, analytics collection, for enforcing the policies uh, that, that change the behavior of the API, and um, uh, all of the other magic that API management can make happen. And this API can be hosted anywhere. It can be hosted on premise. It can be hosted on a rival cloud platform. And I mean, obviously, we'd love it to be on Azure. It can be hosted on Azure. In that case, you're probably going to get the best performance because it's going to be very close. You can put it in the same data center, et cetera. And the API can be hosted um, on, on any type of platform, you know, Windows, Linux, and written in any language, Python, Java, .NET, we don't care. As long as it talks HTTP, then we love it. We love all APIs. So let me give you a quick demo. Now, I will make this quick because I know if you've seen me talk about API management before, you have seen this demo before, and I apologize um, for showing you the calculator. I keep thinking I should come up with a different scenario. However, it's, um, it's such a simple scenario to show. It's very quick, and I want to get through this and get on to show you some of the cool new stuff that we have in the pipe and also leave some time for questions because obviously we have a very um, uh, interactive audience here, so I really want to make the most of that and get your feedback. So let's go and take a quick look at the product. So over here on the portal, I'm signed in. And if I go to the API management tab, you see I have a number of services. I have one here called API demo that I created earlier. If I wanted to create a new one, it's super easy. New app services, API management, create, enter some details. And in a matter of moments, I'll be able to create a new API management service in all of these 15 regions um, in Azure. So it's a really good global coverage now. I've created a service here already, so I'm going to go and use that one. And um, I have, obviously, all of the usual screens you'd expect in the Azure portal. Um, I saw there was a question, is it HTTP only? It is HTTP and HTTPS only. Yep, those are the protocols that we support. Um, uh, we have a dashboard, obviously, with some high-level information. I'll show you an even better dashboard in a moment. You can scale 
the service and notice this is something I want to talk about in a few minutes is the new premium tier. You can configure custom C names for that proxy and custom C names for that developer portal and lots more stuff I want to show you on this in a minute. But in order to get an API set up, you need to go into the publisher portal. So to do that, I click on the little manage button down here. And what I'm going to do, here you'll see I have um, some business web API I've been playing with. I have no analytics data for this because I've not been using it. I want to show you just how easy it is to add an API and get started. So I'm going to start managing an API. And we have an API that we use for such demos um, that's called the calculator API. And it basically adds two numbers. So I'm going to call this the calculator. I'm going to enter the back end service, which happens to be And then I need to specify a suffix. Well, it's optional. I don't need to specify it, but I'm going to. And call it calc. And I say which scheme I want to support. Do I want to score HTTP, HTTPS only, et cetera, et cetera. And also I can now, this is a new thing for those who are familiar with the product, I can now very quickly add my API to an existing product right here in the, um, in the, in the ad screen. This is a new thing, it accelerates how quick it is to add your APIs. So I'm gonna hit save, and in a matter of seconds, my new API is added, and all I need to do now is add some operations. And I'm gonna do that add operation, and I can tell you that the API for that looks like, oh sorry, the, the route for that looks like this, API add, a equals A and B equals B. So I'll zoom in on this so you guys can see it real clear. And notice how I've used this sort of templating language. Now, one of the cool, th one of the many cool things you can do with API management is configure rules that change the behavior of the API. So I'm going to do a rewrite, real simple here. I'm now going to change the way this API looks and make it look very different and you guys can work out how this would work so we take this url fragment and apply it over here so the front end of this api now looks like this rather than this old query string style down here i'm going to give this a name call it the number adder i could enter an description here this adds numbers um, and i can also enter details about responses that's going to help my documentation so let's add a json representation uh, where's application json there it is. Um, so let's say result is four, for example. Um, I can turn on caching just with the click of a, a checkbox here. Caching is enabled. That's going to increase the performance of my API because it's going to reduce the load on the back end. And it's going to um, uh, use the in-memory high-performance cache of the proxy. So it's going to actually increase the response time as well. So uh, caching is so easy to set up. You can configure a number of settings here. Actually, you can configure even more settings in the advanced policy screen, which I'll show you in just a moment. I can document the parameters. This is param A. You know, say what type that is. That's a number. Give some example values, etc. Uh, the back end can be hosted on premise. Yep. I'll, I'll show you a cool new feature on that front as well in a moment. This is the second number. And maybe in this case, I don't want to choose one of the existing values. So I'm going to type my own and say it's an integer, etc. You get the idea. I can add lots of metadata. This is helping describe my API. Now, if you think this is pretty dull entering all this text, then of course, you can also import your API metadata from Swagger or Waddle, which are both common um, HTTP description formats. Um, so I've added my API. Now I want to show you how this is manifested in our developer portal, which is hosted entirely on Azure API management and allows you to provide a, a, a sort of very easy to understand uh, and uh, Sorry, excuse me, how to, how to explain. Um, a, a great developer portal for your partners and developers to come and find and learn about your API. So they would come to this place here. If they hadn't already signed in, I'm signed in as the administrator because I came from the admin portal. They could click sign up here and we will collect their credentials. Um, they could sign in via Facebook, Twitter, Google, etc. cetera. Um, or they can do custom accounts. And we're gonna manage all of that identity for you um, and manage the subscriptions to APIs all part of the turnkey service. This whole thing is hosted on Azure API management. You can customize this entire portal to exactly match your brand um, without even writing any code. We have a design experience that allows you to click elements and pick the colors and change the text and change the font size and drop in images. And it's all based on a content management system so you can add your own pages as well. Now notice here that I'm gonna to go to the APIs page and you'll see that we have our newly added API right here. So if I go and click on that, 
I'll be able to see all of my operations. The metadata that I entered is being used to generate the documentation on the fly. So I get a really good experience from my developers that tells them how to call my calculator API. We can even invoke um, or show them how to invoke the API from code. So this Ruby sample is generated dynamically based on the metadata that we just entered or metadata that you import. So pretty cool. Um, and someone's already made a call, which is nice. Um, and my favorite feature is the console, which allows you to interactively try out the API. So I'm going to make a call here. I'm going to say three and five. I choose my developer key, which identifies me as a developer. I hit get. That's going to invoke the API in real time. And you'll see I got a response. In this case, it says eight, which we know is the right answer. And this is the response that's actually coming from the underlying API. Uh, it's our API, so we added a little add to it. This is not something that the API management service goes and does to your um, to your um, API, although there are some jokes that that's maybe what we should do to give you free tiers. We can slip in um, sponsored advertising. It's a joke. Don't worry, we're not going to do that. Um, so this is coming from the original back end, and I'll show you some cool stuff we can do with that in just a minute. Okay, so one other thing I want to show you now is policies. Policies are um, I haven't mentioned time to first successful call. Maybe I'll maybe I'll swivel that in in just a moment. Um, actually, let's go and do it, Mike, since you asked so nicely. So one of the reasons we added this console is there is a measure in API programs called the TTFT or time to first successful call. And the idea is you want to reduce the amount of time it takes for a developer that tries your service to successfully execute a transaction. And so hopefully you're convinced by seeing this experience that with a, with a console like this, it makes it so easy for a developer to learn how to invoke your API, get a transaction flowing through the system, and then go and recreate that um, using uh, uh, in, their own, in their own sort of service or application. And again, using it with the, with the samples that we have generated down here, for example. OK, so back over to policies, which are my favorite feature of the product. So if I add a, a policy, I can set a policy at any scope. In fact, I think I already have one here on the unlimited tier. So what I'm going to do is just going to delete this here for a moment. And what I'm going to do is configure a policy. A policy is a, uh, a part of our proxy engine that allows you to change the behavior of the underlying API. You can add, you know, caching is a policy. We can check headers. We can validate JWT tokens. We can enable cores for your service, all with just a little bit of XML. I'm going to show you two policies very quickly here. The first one I'm going to show you is um, uh, we're going to apply to the to the number adder um, policy. Notice that I turned on caching, so you can already see. Um, the caching capability here. You can already see the rewrite um, URI as well. Actually, I'm going to cancel out of this. Let's go and apply an API, sorry, a policy to the API, to all operations. So I'm going to add a new policy. And what this is going to do, it's going to say, if the response of this API is XML, I would like to turn that into JSON. Now, we're always going to do that regardless of what the client says. So let's say that we, we uh, consider the accept header is false. But we do only want to do it if the response type is, is XML. So we'll say, actually, let's, let's be brute force. Let's say always try and make this conversion. Let's say always do it. And then we get a choice of what type of JSON we'd like. I'm going to say direct because I think it creates prettier JSON. I hit save. That gets pushed out to the uh, to the proxies, and then in a matter of minutes, um, we'll be able to go and test this change by invoking the API. It'll be less than minutes, actually, a matter of seconds. Let's invoke that API now, and if the proxies are updated, notice that we're now getting um, a JSON response. So pretty cool, all done with just a little, uh, little bit of configuration. The last policy I want to show you very quickly is the rate limiting policy. That's one of our most popular. So we're in the unlimited product. Our API was added to the unlimited product. So I'm going to go and make a modification to the unlimited product on the inbound path that says, let's limit the call rate. And we're going to limit the call rate for all operations. And we're going to make it for two calls in a given 30 second period, for example. I hit save. And then in a matter of seconds, that's going to push out to our proxies. And let's go and make a couple of calls here. So we make one call, we get a 200 OK. We make two calls, we get a 200 OK. We make three calls, we get a 429. Too many requests response back from the server. And you can actually see here, 
it says rate limit is exceeded, try again in 27 seconds. And we also have that in machine readable format as the retry after header as per the HTTP spec. So rate limiting is super, super easy to implement here and add to your existing API. So these are some of our most commonly used features, super popular caching, rate limiting, um, cores, and so easy to go and add to an existing API without writing a single line of code. So that's a quick overview of the product. We have a lot more material on our on our uh, homepage. So if you go to azure.microsoft.com slash APIM, you'll see our service page that talks about the um, that talks about the service here, a little video with me and Scott Hanselman talking about the product. And if you go over to our documentation, you'll find lots of guides and also um, some videos that are well worth checking out that go over the product in more details and different areas of the product. So that's a quick overview of um, API management where we were a little while ago. We've made a lot of updates since we um, since we released the preview. So let me show you what some of these are. So we made general availability happen, and that's a great big milestone because now customers can really, really depend on the service because we give them that SLA. Um, we have um, static IP, so you can, the IPs of our proxies are de dependable, and therefore you can lock down your firewalls and your on-premise or your cloud servers and say that only um, calls from this AP, um, IP are accepted, which uh, one other security mechanism you can make to ensure that the traffic is coming from the API proxy. Um, we have OAuth 2 support. So now if you have an OAuth 2 enabled API, you can sign into that API via the, in the console so that you, know, you can test an OAuth API as well. Um, we added backup and restore so you can manage real high, um, high availability scenarios and be ready for any disaster recovery. Or if you guys go and mess something up in your configuration, you can restore to a previous version. We had a mutual certificate authentication between the proxy and the back end, so you can have extreme security around being sure that the back end is only being communicated to from um, from the from the proxy. You can now we can now support root APIs, so you don't have to have a URL fragment for each API. We added HTTP support. I know it sounds like that should always be there, but on the front end now, a number of customers don't need, for whatever reason, don't want the HTTPS, and therefore they want HTTP support. Um, usually for insecure, very high performance reasons. So they're not they're not worried about the security of this API for whatever reason, and they don't want to pay the price of a HTTPS connection. Um, but we do terminate the HTTP connection at the um, proxy, so that can boost performance if you have the proxy more locally um, uh, located to the client. As I'm sure you know, there's sort of seven handshakes to set up HTTPS connection, so you really want that to be close to the client that's connecting to it. We added subscription per app. Um, we made a number of performance improvements to the developer experience, particularly, um, and the proxy, which is already very was already extremely fast. It's getting faster all the time. We're in um, all of the Azure regions, including Australia. Uh, delegation was an awesome feature that allows you to, um, if you don't want to use our identity system for the developer portal, you don't need to. You can. Um, actually uh, uh, delegate uh, using a single sign-on mechanism we've created to your existing sign-on mechanism. Let's imagine you have your own website or your own identity system. You can easily integrate that into the API management product now. Um, we have um, improved caching performance significantly um, and have also allowed you to customize the subscription keys. So you may have saw that the subscription key is typically passed as a query string of type subscription dash key. You can change that to be um, and anything you like. So it could be a header, for example, and the header could be foobar or whatever you like, which is used because we're actually winning a lot of customers from our rivals. I won't say any names, but you know who they are. And we're winning a lot of customers from those guys, and they already have some different subscription key, and they want to move customers over without any interruption of service. And so that features there and is helping us. Um, we already have a number of wins from, from um, rival platforms, which we're super happy with. Um, compression support has been added. So if you have a gzip enabled API, we'll now support gzip on the front end as well, as well as Google Analytics support, which can plug into your developer portal. And then you can obviously um, see what's going on in your developer portal and understand how well you're converting uh, potential developers into um, API adopters. Uh, we've improved the, the UI to make it easier to set up APIs. You saw that one part of that with the product um, dialog and widget that we have on the add new API. We've added a bunch of new policies like check header and much more. Now, the biggest recent announcement, which was on, I think it was January 
2021, something like that, was we announced the launch of Azure API Management Premium. This is a very exciting tier. What Some of our most demanded features are part of this tier, and it really allows us to take the type of API programs we support to the next, to the next level. So I want to explain what's in this. So we've increased the throughput of the API management capability significantly. So prior to introducing the premium tier, we had the standard tier and the developer tier. The developer tier has no SLA, is really not designed for a production environment. I would highly advise against using it in a production environment. There can be some short downtime periods during upgrades. It is designed for um, development, testing, functional testing only. Um, and it's a very low cost um, API. It's uh, $50 per month for the, for the API proxy there. And um, that is not a profit-making service for us. It's a, a loss-making service for us to help, uh, to help people uh, come and learn how to use the service. The standard tier of Azure API management is priced at $700 per month or just under $699 per month and includes 200 million API calls. Um, it has a throughput of around 1,000 requests per second, depending on what you're doing, but it can comfortably uh, manage 1,000 requests per second in most scenarios, has a one gigabyte cache, and you can deploy up to four instances to the same geograph geographical region. So you can have four in Australia East, for example. Um, uh, one of the big things that Premium introduces is you can now scale out your API management service. First of all, each premium instance includes a billion API calls per month and 5,000 requests per second is, is pretty typical, what we can support sometimes more, um, potentially less depending on what you're doing in terms of the, uh, uh, to the excuse me, depending on what you're doing um, in the policies. But you know, in most cases, we see people hitting 5,000 without any challenges at all. Um, a five gigabyte cache and multi-geography deployment. So you can now have a single instance of API management deployed to multiple geographies, but talking to the same backend DNS entry. And that allows you to really make the most of that caching capability, make the most of that HTTPS termination capability, um, and gives you high availability as well. Actually, when the premium tier comes out of preview, this will offer a 99.95% SLA. Um, and you can have up to 10 units per region without giving us a call. If you want more than that, um, just give us a call and we will um, uh, we can help you get it beyond 10 units per region um, for the really large scale APIs. Another feature we added to the premium tier is virtual private network support. So you can now connect those different proxies to your to your VPN. And the price is uh, at the moment during preview it will be 14.25 per month for a pre per premium instance. And post preview, I expect it to be around 28.49 um, per month. And as Kent explained, this is extremely competitive in this market, extremely competitive for these features. And we're going to keep adding features to this all the time and just going to push that um, and push that needle even further. So um, a fantastic and exciting announcement for us with the premium tier. And we're already seeing um, some strong adoptions. So very, very excited about that. So let me give you a quick tour of some of the premium features. Oh, there was one thing I missed, actually. I don't know if you saw it. it. was Azure Active Directory integration is part of our premium solution as well. So now you can easily integrate Azure Active Directory into your premium to so your developer portal. You can lock down your developer portal so that perhaps only your internal employees can sign in or another um, federated organization. You could say that Contoso can come and sign into your Fabricam um, developer portal and lock it down, et cetera, et cetera. So some really nice features there for partner programs and for internal API agility programs. So let's go and take a quick look. I'm just going to take you on a tour, really, of those new premium features. And it starts back in the AUX portal. So the first thing you'll see is if we go to scale, um, and I, I love this. You can see that if I wanted to take this um, tier to premium, I simply click on premium here. And you notice that I have at the moment one unit in north central US. Let's imagine I'd like to take that to two units. And also, I have some customers in Australia. So I'd like to have a unit over there because that's going to give me you know, uh, the best best um, performance for my cash in Australia, Southeast. And now that I've got this in two regions, I get that 99.95% SLA. And also, I have a lot of customers in Europe. Actually, that's my most populous region. So I'm going to go and put six units there. So notice how you can choose how you're going to distribute the units to help you manage the capacity. Um, and I could hit save on that. I'm not, that'll take a few minutes to deploy, so I'm not actually going to make those changes. Now. Um, 
if I switch to a, a premium instance I created earlier, notice I have this here in Australia East and in West US. If I go to my configure tab, you guys will see I also have um, VPN support down here that I can turn on. So I'm going to go and take a quick look at that. I have no VPN network set up, but if I did, there'd be a little drop down here that allows me to pick the VPN I want to connect each region to. Um, virtual private networks are per region, so you have to have multiple VPNs if you have multiple regions, but that's just a question of creating the different networks, so very easy to do. I love how easy the service has made this to do multi-region deployment. This is something you don't have to worry about. We configure traffic manager. Um, we configure traffic manager for you. Um, so that you don't have to worry about routing. And that will work by routing to the nearest available proxy, or in the event that a proxy has, for whatever reason, let's imagine Azure is having an issue in a data center, it will start routing, uh, it will fail and route to available data centers based on proximity. So, so really great, um, really great features. I saw, I think I'm seeing a couple of questions come in. Uh, no, this is the full. Um, this is the full Azure virtual networking capability, and you cannot. If you're an Express Route customer, you can use it with. Um, you can use it with um, uh, Express Route as well. So that's the VPN capability. Let me go, show you very quickly the. Um, switch back to the dashboard. The Azure Active Directory setup. So I'm going to go manage this. We set up this in the Publisher portal. And if I go to security, identities, notice how I've already configured my Active Directory um, setup. And notice also how I've turned off all of the other options. So this is a new feature now, is you can disable the custom identity feature that we provide out of the box. So now you can only sign into this particular developer portal using Azure, API, using Azure Active Directory. And I'll just show you that quickly here if I go over um, and try and sign in with my appropriate CorpNet credentials. Oh, I'm already signed in, actually, so I'm going to, uh, let me just do this. Let's go and use a new incognito window. Hit sign in. You can see now there's only one option, and this will pop a, a dialog that would ask me to go and sign in with my Active Directory credentials, et cetera, et cetera, and that's how I sign into this into this particular solution. So very, very cool for internal API programs. And notice also how, uh, where did my window go? I think I killed it. Uh, notice also how you can uh, specify multiple tenants. So I could allow different tenants to sign in, um, and you would configure in Active Directory those same tenants to have access via this client ID and client secret. So now I could actually have my internal API program. I could also extend that to Fabricam and Contoso. You get the idea. So super cool feature. I'm running. Realize we're running a little bit tight on time. If you guys want to um, uh, ask Q and A, so. Uh, Michael Stevens asked about ADFS. We only support Azure Active Directory at this time. Um, if ADFS is something you would need, then I'd love your feedback on that. Um, very much if you have an actual customer that's interested in that, then, then please email me uh, at jtwist at microsoft.com or contact me at Twitter. I'm just typing that into the screen so you can see it. And I'd love to know uh, more about the particular scenario. We're very customer driven, so um, uh, that's interesting. Kent asks, any chance we'll see VPN support for standard tier? Um, at the moment, it's unlikely. Um, with the, 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 there are certain features that are, we think are create a premium, um, uh, to sort of the premium product experience, and that will be, um, and that will be, uh, that's where that's going to live, at least for the, the, for the foreseeable future. Um, we do, ADFS is mentioned in theory a lot. I'm just going to answer to the comments here. This is very frank discussion. I know you guys are, uh, very close to us and therefore I'll have a very frank conversation with you. Um, but actually when it comes to the crunch, we haven't had any customer that, that says ADFS is a must have and is a blocker and actually most in many cases are already working on using DAR sync with Azure Active Directory and are happy to do that enable to enable this scenario. So, you know, if you have a customer that is about to adopt API management but is blocked on ADFS, then that's a big red flag for us. I'd love to know about it. But Again, it, it seems to be a problem in theory, but in practice right now, it's not. it doesn't seem to be, to be causing any issues. So interesting discussion for us to have, perhaps, if we have some time at the end. Okay. So um, um, I'm a theory guy, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, again, a frank discussion with you guys. I know you guys know this, this, this technology well and know this space well. We are a very customer-led team. 
Um, we communicate with customers all the time and with you guys all the time and choose what to do next. And so it's all about prioritization because there are a lot of features customers want. And we want to make sure that the next thing we do is really going to have big bang for the buck and is really going to you know, delight customers. And so every feature has a cost. Even if it's small, like ADFS might be a small thing for us to go and do. We want to make sure when we go and do, we're picking exactly the right thing to go and do next. And we have some pretty exciting stuff coming up. I'll show you some of the stuff, for example, that we're working on um, at the moment. Um, that um, um, we really need versioning. Uh, interesting, Messimo. So by versioning, you mean the ability to abstract the API, the front-end API from the back-end API and do special routing? Yes or no? Yeah, so there's, t there's two ways people think about this, I think. One is to abstract the backend API and do special routing for versioning. And then second is to have literally in the developer portal, uh, do I have a developer portal open? Uh, yeah, in the developer portal, perhaps what I see when I look at APIs is I can see here some kind of drop down that says version 1.1 and 1.2 and then things change appropriately. Right now you can do this, most customers solve this challenge by having calculator version one and calculator version two. It's very, very easy. So you get some level of um, versioning there. We will hopefully in the not too distant future add a way of sort of binding multiple versions to the same API. Um, I'm not sure what, what that question was. We can pick that up at the end. Uh, the same API and um, uh, with this, sorry, with the same API, and you'll be able to have a version drop down here. We'll do that in the future. And actually, I think we've got a little bit of time. I'm going to try and squeeze this in and show you guys some of the stuff we have coming down the pipe. Actually, what I'll do is I'll show you um, uh, the theoretical part of it so that we have some time for some questions. So if I switch back to the slides now, I've already shown you guys the multi-geo feature in premium. And what I want to show you now is a sneak peek of what we have inside in the labs. And that's expressions. So you saw how we had these XML statements inside the policy engine that allowed you to uh, make static adjustments to the in-flight request, you know, like set rate limiting or add um, set rate limiting or uh, what was the other one we did or convert XML to JSON. We're now adding the capability to execute code in those policy statements. So take a look here. What we're doing here is we're setting a header. That means that the incoming request doesn't have a header called inbound IP. Or if, even if it does, we're going to override it. That's what the exist action will do. And we're going to set it to the value of the incoming request IP address. That allows me to forward the IP address of the client onto the back end. So you could, instead of calling this inbound IP, you could make it X forwarded for, for example, or the XFF header. There's all kinds of cool stuff you can do this with this. So if you want to send additional metadata, for example, to your back end API, um, if you want to send um, additional metadata to your back end API, you can do it using these C-sharp statements that are written inside the policy. So this is Razor syntax, if you're familiar with C-sharp. And in this case, I'm sending the email address of the developer to the back end, never to the client. The client will never see this, unless for some reason you want that to happen, but that's a questionable decision. Um, and we'll send it to your back end, and there's other mechanisms you can use. So any, any of these settings, you know, what the header name was, for example, can be configured using these scripts. This becomes extremely powerful, enables a lot of scenarios. And we also have conditionals. So you can now say, apply a policy only if a certain condition is met. So in this case, what we're saying is, apply a policy only if the, cl the header that is cl called client is V2. So this is where you're going to get your versioning story, that special routing story. And what we do here with this next statement, this set backend service, which is a new policy, we're actually going to change the backend it goes to, to create that dynamic routing engine that opens up a lot of really, really interesting scenarios. And again, this could be a code statement here if you wanted it to be, you know, this could be a, a, a snippet of code. Um, but instead, what we're doing here is we're saying, if we get a client that's V2, send it to this different backend. If we get a client that isn't V2, that says something else, then you can send it to, you know, it'll go to the default backend or do something else or set a header, whatever you like. So you can set up these conditionals. You can use expressions to execute code. And you can use set backend service to change the backend URL. 
that's going to be invoked. That's something we have in our labs now, so I'd love some feedback. I want to leave some time for, for Q&A. So actually, let's switch over to, um, let's pull up the chat window. And um, Mike, how do you want to do this? I, I remember there was some other discuss thread to do it, or do you just want to run it off here for now? Okay, let's take a look at this. There we go. Uh, close this guy down so I can see. Uh, y yes, so this question, if I had one instant of API Manager Premium, use multi-geo to deploy two regions, you have two units, and that's what you're paying for. What am I paying for? A proxy for my existing API with some caching? Well, I'd say you're paying for quite a bit more than that. Some some customers want the uh, uh, actually want the caching. That is the thing people are paying for. Um, but also, they want to have um, the rate limiting capabilities. And also, don't forget all of this developer portal experience. So, if you were trying to ha have add an API program, you'd have to go and build a documentation experience. You'd have to go and build a sign up and registration experience that manages identities. You'd have to build a way of keeping those in sync. Um, our API experience you know, has a lot for developers actually. So as a developer, I can come in, I can manage my subscription keys, I can roll those keys. This is all stuff you'd have to go and build. I can understand analytics reports for my consumption of the API as a developer. So you can see as a developer, I can see what I'm doing on this API and understand these capabilities. I can see which APIs I'm calling, which products I'm using. We have a product management system that allows you to apply quotas if you're selling your API. So it really augments your API in a, in a pretty big way. Um, also, not to forget that we have analytics in here, the whole user management system, an ACL system. So uh, you can put users in groups and then apply groups to products that allows you to sort of access control limit um, who can access which APIs and which documentation. So it adds an awful lot to your API, and that's why that's why people are, um, are paying for this service. Actually, I will say we are... Um, extremely price competitive you know there is a there are a number of vendors in this market and our prices are very good our ease of use is um is very good as well it's very easy to come in and create an api um, and that's just going to get better as we refine our experience we're going to add more and more features um, if you already have an sla that gives you the an api that gives you the sla you need and you don't need any of these features then sure you don't you don't need this product that's fine um let me switch back to the question um subscription security how can i secure it to a registered authorized users do I need to do this myself there's two layers of authentication in play when you're using our API management product there is typically user authentication which we don't get in the way of that travels transparently through the proxy on the authorization header um, that's not something we um, uh, do anything with um, however we add a level of partner or developer authentication that allows you to manage developers or individual applications. And for example, you could lock down, sign up to the developer portal, create a subscription for each app you have, like maybe you have an iOS app, maybe you have a web app, maybe you have an Android app. And those keys then are, 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 for, are, are for those applications. Now, if you have a problem with one of those apps, you can actually shut down access for just that application, or you can rate limit one application different to another, and that helps you. Uh, you can also view the traffic coming in from different applications to understand, you know, which one's more popular, which one's driving more traffic. You can understand the uh, caching strategy is working. You can understand whether one client's seeing more errors in the analytics. We show you the errors that are happening on your API, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think we have one more comment here. So how do I secure my backend service? We have a number of options for you there. Um, that's, you could use the VPN in the, in the premium tier that we showed, the virtual private network. You can also use mutual certificates, which is a very good way of securing the backend. Um, if you can't use any of those options, you can use mutual, uh, sorry, basic authentication is supported. You can lock it down by EP addre IP address in addition to all of those methods. We'll tell you what the IP address of the proxies are. And uh, finally, you could do a shared secret authentication as well. So there's, there's a lot of options for securing the back end. A lot of, a lot of questions here. Wow, look at all this. This is great. Um, how much information can be collected via Razor Syntax? Is it possible to collect data from data lookups? So it isn't possible at this time to make an asynchronous request. Um, we'll be looking into that space at the moment. So if you wanted to go and look up uh, from another API, for example, to decide how to route it. 
Um, can we get custom code examples to create complete examples with OAuth authentication code example? That would be custom policies, which is something we're exploring. Is the idea for you to implement your own policy? Um, I would say go and have a look at our user voice, uh, feedback.azure.com, and then find the API management tab and go and get voting on this stuff. Um, we have um, items for, for pretty much everything here. For the AZ, AD security would be great to auto-approve if a user is in a certain group and they request access. Again, that is on our um, roadmap. That's something that we're cooking in the kitchen um, and that I think you would expect to see in the not too distant future. Uh, if I'm a dev, I can see a holistic view of Azure API usage across multiple script descriptions. Uh, not sure I understand. Is that a question or was that adding to this discussion we were having about the um, about the um, uh, what is it I'm trying to say here about the uh, why would I use this? Um, is there an easy way to expose an OData endpoint? Um, yes, absolutely. OData is you know, we don't do anything special for OData. Uh, it is very easy to generate, uh, to, to document an OData API in our system. At some point in the future, we'll probably allow the upload of the metadata to dynamically create the API endpoint. But right now, you can just create simple operations, use our wildcard slash star um, for anything that, you know, you want to make a, a wildcard in the URL fragment, and you can easily put an OData endpoint behind this. Uh, Azure Mobile Services supports custom APIs. What are some scenarios where you could leisure, uh, leverage Azure API management? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one way you might think of, we actually have a number of people doing this, Kent. Uh, one way you might think of uh, mobile services is a, is a very quick way of building an API. And therefore, like our colleague said before, why would I use this? If you want these other features like API analytics, um, all of the developer portal engagement scenarios, et cetera, um, uh, if you wanted, you know, the ability to support different APIs or lock down different clients and do rate limiting based on different um, clients, um, then uh, that is uh, that is totally possible. We have a number of customers doing it today. Um, you can use the Service Bus Relay. Yeah, that's right. If you use the HTTP Web Relay connection um, that exposes a sort of a RESTful or RESTish. Um, web API via Relay, then that is co connect collectible around the, um, the service bus. As Mike says, that, that you have to create a long-lived token for that to, to embed into the proxy. Um, that's one thing we'll look at is potentially a policy to auto sign in to to auto refresh the token based on the the, the you know the primary key. I feel like I'm paying twice, once for hosting my service in Azure or wherever, and then for this of which my service already does, security done, subscriptions done, secure documentation done, caching done, all in the backend service. It's pretty standard. Once the developers find my backend service, it's much quicker to call that directly, avoid one hop, than for me to avoid the cost. Yeah, I think that's a fine opinion, if, if that's how you feel. Um, I think our adoption shows that people see a lot of value in this. I mean, I'll put it clearly that let's imagine you're buying, let's imagine you're a big customer, you're buying two premium instances. Um, uh, you know, that's a that's a pretty meaty scenario. That's, you know, 20, a very frank discussion here about pricing. Let's times that by two. Then you're paying, you know, maybe you're paying $70,000 a year for, for a lot of features, a service that's managed at a high level. Um, people find that significantly less than they'd spend on, say, um, a developer to, to, to manage something of a similar scale infrastructure and importance for their business. So it's all just a question of how important is it to you. And if you are happy to go and roll your own, then again, I, I'm with, we're fully supportive of that. Um, uh, makes sense for you. Great. Wow, look at all these questions. Uh, analytics done, lockdown done, rate limits done already in back end. Um, awesome. I'm glad that you, you know, again, it, it, typically that gets harder as you go to, um, as to scale out, particularly rate limiting across nodes, across clusters, in a way that's actually sharing that information is a pretty non- uh, non-trivial problem. If you're happy that you've solved all those problems, then that's great. Uh, some organizations only want to use FTP, FTPS, or SDP. Are you planning on adding support for any of those? Uh, it, it's an interesting question. Um, I would say not right now, but you know, we're certainly that's something that's under under exploration. So um, it's something that we're thinking about anyway. You know, it's a, I wouldn't say it's on the roadmap, but we're looking at it. Um, how would you integrate into a billing system or transfer your API? We're actually working on some samples now. Azure API Management has a management API. Um, so I know that's confusing. It's a sort of palindrome in terms of words, but 
most, a lot of our customers that are doing this integrate with our management API to pull out the analytics or to set up the products or the subscriptions programmatically and that's how they are doing their billing. And it actually doesn't take a whole lot of code. They integrate with their commerce provider of choice. So, you know, Stripe or PayPal or whatever. And that's how they're doing it. Like Fantasy Data is a good example that's doing, that's doing this. I think we're a little bit over on time. Sorry for the rough start. Felt a bit of a rush to get through all that content. I thoroughly enjoyed all the questions and the presentation, um, uh, giving the presentation to you guys. Oh, I see I have one more comment. Uh, does it integrate with Azure Search, Document DB, or other Azure APIs as well as mine? Uh, you can integrate it with Azure Azure APIs. It's uh, uh, it's it's entirely possible. Any any REST API, any HTTP API can be pretty easily managed with the product. Um, we don't know anything specific for those products. That said, um, but um, uh, it's totally possible. Uh, Seventy k something I've already done. Once off, this does not justify the cost. Yeah, it doesn't. So it doesn't sound to you like. First of all, it doesn't sound like you'd need the premium tier for whatever reason. It also doesn't sound like you need all the developer onboarding, the subscription key management, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I, th I think we've probably a little bit of a moot point on that one. Like I think I get it. You 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 feel like you don't need this. That's great. No problem though. Any other questions? Yeah, no problem at all. Thank you, guys. Thanks for the feedback. Hope you enjoyed it. And our friend WHY, I don't know who that is, uh, can go and show his boss how much money he's saving him. Thanks, guys. I'm going to leave you there. Thank you very much. Cheers. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye-bye.